All right, hello and welcome to Operation Shark Bait, a live demonstration to show how the search and rescue service of the Galileo satellites can help speed up the launch of a rescue operation. I'm Monica Jones, I'm on board the Sirius utility vessel. Uh, actually, I'm on the bridge there together with a few other people all eager to watch the operation as it unfolds. We've uh, about half an hour ago, we left to the port of Ostend and headed out to the North Sea. And you've got you can see behind me already there's a life raft out there now that's what this mission is all about to save the person on this life raft it is a volunteer don't ask me why she volunteered but she did her name is uh, Tara Foster she is a TV and social media star and as I mentioned she said yep I'll be the one to go onto this life raft somewhere out there on the North Sea and uh, then you can get this rescue mission started and all she's got on her is a a rescue beacon, a distress beacon, which she will activate very soon. We have prepared a little graph for you to see what happens when she activates this uh, 406 megahertz Cospa Sarsat distress beacon, and I hope you can see it right now. I don't have a monitor, so I'm somewhat blind, but I hope you can see that as soon as she activates the signal, it will be received by a Galileo satellite. It will be relayed to the ground stations where uh, the position will be computed that information will be passed on to the mission control centers and they then find the rescue center nearest to that position in our case it is the maritime rescue uh, coordination center here in Ostende and once all of that happened they will launch the rescue operation and you can follow every step of this rescue operation which is in line with the real thing this is how a rescue operation would really be underway we're not cheating we're not trying to make it look nicer than it would be in reality the only difference perhaps is that we're close to uh, the shore of, well, not the shore of Ostende, but you might see the coast uh, of Ostende behind us uh, in certain shots. Well, it is still a demonstration and not the real thing. We don't have to put Tara in any greater danger than is absolutely necessary, but the rest is really as it would unfold in real life. Also, the weather is so far, it's okay. It's a bit choppy, not too bad, but I'm sure that Tara would beg to differ with me and we can actually talk to her right now. I just need to get the walkie-talkie. So let's see if she's uh, ready to talk to us. Hello Tara, can you hear us? Hello Tara, here is Monica on board the Sirius. We can see your life raft, but we cannot yet hear you. Do you receive my signal? That's certainly an interesting start to the mission. I'll give it one more go. Hello Tara, I'm on channel 15 and hopefully you have that same channel and you're ready to talk to us. We just want to know how you're holding up. Well, the good news is that we can see the life raft, which we wouldn't in real life, but then again, this is a demonstration and we know that she's on there. So let's just assume that she could hear us. One last try. And I keep pressing the right button, I hope. Tara, here is Monica. Can you hear me? Apparently, she doesn't feel like talking. And uh, I can't blame her for that. So hopefully, what she will have done by now is activate the distress beacon. And just in order to show you how that would work, I've got one here. So this is one of those 406 megahertz Cosmos test, test, radio test radio beacons tech. that she has on her life raft as well. She opens it like this, with two hands hopefully, there we are, unleashes this, and there you are. This is a bit like a mobile phone, so it, it has all the data in there, it can uh, encode to the position and send it then uh, to our Galileo satellite uh, at uh, 
23,000 altitude. This little thing here can uh, transmit life-saving signals. This is quite amazing. Uh, it costs about 200 euros, and I'm sure it's money well spent. Uh, certainly, if I was on this life raft, I would love to have one of those. So this is activated and okay. keeps sending now the signal. And the signal, as I mentioned earlier, will be received by the ground stations and then passed on mm. to mission control centers. And I assume that you will now see footage of uh, Toulouse, uh, where the Sar Galileo, do I get a second one? We'll try again. I'll get a different walkie-talkie, and we just try again. So let's rewind and go back to Tara. Can you hear me? Here's Monica on board the Sirius. Well, maybe there are too many mobile phones on here. I don't know, but I cannot hear a thing. Oui. This is the right oui, button. Bien sûr. She should hear me. Non, -moi, maybe me hers doesn't work and she doesn't have a second one like I do. All right, I think I'm very positive because she's she knows what she's doing. I'm pretty positive that she has launched the signal by now. And I hope that we get the footage of Toulouse. I hope you're watching this already, uh, where we look at the Sar Galileo ground segment. It's organized in Europe uh, with uh, the Centre National d'Etude Spatial in Toulouse, that is CNES. Uh, they coordinate the distress uh, alerts in the European zone and distribute them through uh, the COSPAS SARSAT network. Um, to provide beacon identification and location information, satellite downlinks are processed by ground receiving stations called MEO local user terminals. Uh, there's a SAR Galileo data service provider coordinating the MEO loots from Norway, Cyprus and Spain. And then there's the French Mission Control Center, FMCC, that's the one we'll be watching out for. Uh, the Mission Center of Casper Sarset in Europe, which uses uh, the French MEO loot. And right now they'll be busy uh, looking for for uh, Tara's distress signal to compute her position and then pass that information on uh, to uh, the uh, nearest uh, rescue station. And uh, we're basically waiting for the signal now, provided she has activated the beacon. We couldn't speak to her. By the way, that helicopter that you can hear probably uh, and maybe sometimes see, this is not yet a helicopter to rescue Tara. This is a helicopter to take footage uh, to film this whole uh, rescue operation. So don't let this confuse you. So I'm basically waiting now to have confirmation that the signal was received, provided it was launched, which I cannot check right now because the only way to communicate with Tara was through the walkie-talkie and she didn't respond. So we just have to wait and see. What I can tell you is that the signal should be localized about one and a half minutes after the beacon was activated. Then it takes a good minute later in order to have the first confirmation of that position. And then a few minutes later, there'll be an update of that confirmation. Yes, and the reason for that is that, as you can see, that life raft behind me is drifting. It is completely exposed to the elements. So the first position that we get might change. And so there has to be a confirmation so they can narrow the area down to the most precise location before they launch the rescue operation. Now, as we're waiting and waiting and waiting, well, that is part and parcel of a live demonstration. Uh, perhaps I can introduce you to a gentleman uh, who is actually, to a large part, uh, responsible also for Galileo. And the cameraman keeps uh, trying to signal something. Um, but I would like to talk to this gentleman now. Uh, so, Paul Flamand, if you could uh, join me now. He's uh, part of the European Commission, head of unit program management, Galileo. Yes. Uh, first of all, how are you holding up? It's, uh, it's moving a bit? It's moving a lot today. There is a lot of swell, so. but it's very interesting. That makes the demonstration interesting, I think. Life conditions. Yeah. And I think it's, what, it, what is also interesting that it's life, that things don't run 100% smoothly. That real life wouldn't be like that either. Yes, uh, in real life, accidents can happen, distress can happen, and this is what we are trying uh, to do here today. What I'm pretty happy about is that in terms of 
rescue operation, things are going okay. It seems that maybe we have some problems with videos or sound, but for the rest, things are uh, going according to plans. And video and sound, that is not crucial to saving somebody's life. That's, so let's talk a little bit about the Galileo uh, search and rescue service and the satellites included in all that. So uh, how does this fit into European space program as a whole? Okay, so satellite navigation and Galileo is our European satellite navigation uh, program. It's made of uh, 26 satellites, 24 of which do carry equipment which allow for rescuing people. So therefore, if there is a distress at sea, the people just simply trigger a beacon and a signal are then taken up by our 24 Galileo satellites. And uh, that allows for the detection of uh, distress uh, action. And the satellites are then able to localize from where that uh, distress uh, signal was emitted. And once the detection of the position has been uh, found, then it is transmitted to the rescue yeah, centers the which come and help the people who are in distress. So basically uh, Galileo is providing positioning information. We have several services and this search and rescue service is one which fits very well with uh, the technology and the infrastructure we have developed. Now I can just see there is uh, some movement happening behind us. There is uh, another boat with some divers there at the life raft. So I'm not quite sure. Maybe they're trying and so solve the problem with uh, uh, the walkie-talkie. Maybe there is another problem. So we'll just uh, keep observing what's happening uh, behind. Uh, from what I can see, they are the beacon. The beacon has been activated. So at least we've got that uh, confirmed now. So we know now it'll take about a minute, a minute and a half until hopefully in Toulouse they will say we've got it. Yes, what is very nice with Galileo is that um, the search and rescue function of Galileo works 24 hours a day all over the globe. So far, the organization which was in charge of search and rescue operation used, and this organization is called COSPA Sarsat, they were using satellites which were in very low Earth orbit. So if you had no satellite above your head, maybe you were activating your beacon, but a signal was not detected. And I'm just hearing that they are indeed in Toulouse glued to the screen and we should get the first signal any moment. Let's watch and listen. Oh, apparently we didn't just get the signal, apparently we also already got the confirmation of the update. And it took three minutes and 32 seconds from Tara activating the beacon to the moment when the rescue center, in this case the uh, maritime rescue control center in Ostende, could start the rescue mission. Three minutes, 32. That is quite amazing. It is not only quite amazing, but in the past, some of those beacons were activated but never detected by any satellites. Since 2016, when Galileo became operational, now we are 100% sure that there will always be coverage wherever you are, So, which really is uh, a good news for the people sailing uh, and having problems at sea. So that, that is really an achievement and a progress for, uh, for the maritime sector. And it is a European achievement with a lot of different players and it took many years to get it off the ground and it will last for many, many decades to come. It maybe took some years at the beginning uh, in order to convince European government to set up an infrastructure like Galileo. But once this has been decided, I think we can be proud that it, uh, it really took shape pretty quickly. As I said, since 2016, the system is operational. Uh, it was developed thanks to the help of the European Space Agency. The European member states uh, decided to, um, to put the program in the hands of the European Commission with the technical help of the European Space Agency. And we have now created an agency in uh, Prague, in the Czech Republic, which is operating the system, exploiting the system, making sure that it's going to be used uh, by the whole world. And 10 days ago, we even announced that we already have 1 billion users for Galileo, so which is very fast in terms of uh, market uh, take-up. 
And, and perhaps the last one, because this is a system that is now up and running, and it should be up and running for many, many decades, and probably evolve and get even better. Do we have the right people? Not only we have the right people, but for example, for search and rescue operation, we will provide as of next year, as of the moment the Council of Cospasarsat will, will allow this kind of operation, the people at uh, sea in distress will also get a message from the rescue centers that their distress message has been received and that there are some rescue operations taking place coming to rescue them. So this is uh, an improvement of the previous technology which did not allow this kind of uh, return link as we call it. Okay, well, Pape Flamand, thank you very much, because I've just been informed that not only the rescue boat, the Orca 6, uh, R6, uh, has already uh, left in order to dash towards the life raft Antara, but that also the helicopter at the Coxseed base, uh, it's an NH-90, goes by the date Cayman, is also ready to launch to come to Tara's assistance. And uh, I hope, because we do have uh, some of the big decision makers here on board the series, actually, here on the bridge, we have uh, Captain Rejane Rissen. She's the head of the uh, Maritime Rescue uh, Coordination Center in Ostend. We have Captain Kevin Depeuil. He's the operations manager, Coast. So he's in charge of the Orca rescue boat. And we have uh, Colonel uh, Stefan uh, Robruck. He's the base commander at Coxsey there, uh, so he's in charge of the helicopters. And uh, hopefully they come and join me in uh, a very short uh, period of time, because I would like to find out from them or what exactly is happening coming. right now, because we don't have live footage here. I cannot yet see the boat, and I cannot yet hear the helicopter, but uh, I can see that we already have uh, Captain Rejan Rissens here, and, and she is in charge of the MRCC. If you would like to, to join join me right now and uh, the cameraman always tells us uh, because obviously he wants to keep an eye uh, on the boat on the or the life raft we're on the boat uh, so uh, uh, Rejan this is uh, quite exciting even though it is just a demonstration right it's uh, correct it's just a demonstration but we are keen to see in the results of it we are hoping we will receive at the MRCC in Ostend uh, the distress signal within the five minutes that's been told to us. Um, the life raft is live behind us, uh, the weather is rather rough, so we hope uh, the signal is uh, received in very due and very quick time, so we can send out our uh, assets, uh, flying and surface assets, to rescue the lady in the life raft. Now, when this normally happens uh, uh, in, in, in the uh, MRCC, is it a sort of peaceful and calm mood or is everybody very agitated to, to sort of just talk us a little bit through about what happens there? Well, the people in the MRCC, they will receive the emergency signal coming from uh, FMCC Toulouse. Uh, they will take immediately action because it's a distress signal. Uh, they will try to come in contact with the live raft, with the person in distress. And if they can't come in contact with the person in distress, <laughs> it's a little bit rough here. <laughs> we're, we're moving a bit. We're moving a bit. We're on the sea. I put out my sea legs. <laughs> um, they will try to come in contact with the person who's in distress. And if it's not possible, probably at the MRCC they will receive the exact position with an accuracy of two kilometers and send out as quickly as possible uh, the surface and the airborne assets to see what's going on and see what kind of assistance they have to do. And I, and I can I can see that we already have, certainly when it comes to the airborne assets, uh, we already have Colonel Stefan Robrock here, the base commander of Coxide. If you would like to join us as well, and I just uh, sort of move a little bit, uh, and again, our cameraman will tell, you, tell us when we're in the way. So the first thing that is actually being sent out in this uh, rescue operation is the boat, the rescue boat, the Orca. When does the helicopter come into play? But once the signal is sent uh, to the boat well, via the, the satellites uh, to Toulouse and then to MRCC, uh, the Maritime Rescue uh, Coordination Center, then well, the, uh, the center task all, and the boat and the helicopter. And the helicopter uh, will receive the information from our wing operations center. And within the 20 minutes after the signal, the scramble, we should be airborne to, uh, to perform the, the search and the rescue. And I'm just, just hearing the boat so the rescue boat, not us, not the series, is leaving right now. So the boat is getting there first. To do what? Well, if the boat uh, is set out, it means the, the emergency call was received at the MRCC. 
uh, they will direct it to the person, to the victim who's in distress. Uh, they will take uh, what's going on. Uh, they will do an inspection, uh, require the woman who's on board, uh, what's going on, if she's in distress, if she's ill, if she's sick. And after that, uh, if it's necessary for a medical evacuation, our colleagues from the rescue uh, coxida, probably they will hand over the person to the helicopter who will bring over uh, the person to a hospital here in the vicinity. So you basically, you would be on standby because maybe your uh, services are not required. And I hear the helicopter is required in this particular situation. Once we are required, well, the scramble bell will ring. And in that case, the pilots, the crews, because there are people, five people on board, two pilots, uh, a flight engineer, cabin operator, a uh, diver and a nurse were scrambled to the helicopter and within 20 minutes uh, they are supposed to be airborne to join the, the rescue scene. Uh, during the flight, transit flight, till uh, the scene they will receive more information uh, via the MRCC also. And uh, once they are on, on target, then we'll search, we we'll start with the search operations. Once the, the target is found, then we can uh, go over to the rescue operation. Let's talk a bit about those, the rescue preparation, because once the helicopter arrives, and I've just been told that it's on its way now, it will get very, very noisy here, and we won't be able to hear anything. So we have the rescue boat here, the rescue boat determining in which shape Tara is. You have the helicopter arriving. What exactly is happening then from that moment when the helicopter is here? My aim is to bring the, the patient or the, the victim as soon as possible to an hospital. To, uh, but first you have to get it, uh, the victim off the life raft. Yes, so we have to pick up uh, the, the victim uh, to bring it uh, as soon as possible to uh, uh, sanitary, to, uh, to a hospital, to take care of the, 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 the people who was in the water. Tell us a little bit about the winching up, because I spoke to Tara before we uh, headed out, and she says she's perfectly all right with everything, uh, but the winching up is somewhat makes her feel a bit queasy. Why? Yeah, uh, winching is a specific operation, uh, especially with this type of helicopter. It's an 11-ton uh, helicopter, uh, very heavy, and uh, doing a lot of uh, downwash uh, to, the, to the divers and to the people that has to be rescued. So it's very impressive for the people hanging under the, uh, this winch uh, to be winched up and to be picked up uh, to the helicopter. And I can see, we turn around, we can see the rescue boat Orca just now circling or circling in on the life raft. Are they going to open it up and pull her out? Uh, well, they will uh, open, uh, for co of course, uh, the life raft to see if somebody is inside. Uh, they will examine the persons who are inside uh, the life raft. Uh, this information they will hand over to the MRCC, and the MRCC in Ostend will take contact with the RSC Coxide to pass this information as well. And this information is passed to the uh, helicopter where they have a, a medic on board. Eh? So the medic who is joining the, the helicopter, he has already a little knowledge what he might expect on board of the life raft. I mean, how often are, does your, your crew, how often do they have to go out and see and rescue people in this area? Uh, for medical evacuations, we have in total on a yearly basis about an average of 30 persons for a medical evacuation in the Belgium waters. In total, in a yearly basis, we have about 400 incidents as an average. <laughs> And now they can look forward to the fact that everything will go faster, as we just heard from activating the signal to the launch of the rescue operation. It was three minutes, 32 seconds, if I remember correctly, but like it was three and a half. And normally it would take about four hours. That makes life easier also for the rescue crew, doesn't it? Well, when you're in danger, you have to tell the rescue coordination centers that you're in danger. You have different means to do that. One of those things is the use of an uh, EPIRB, an ELT, a personal locator beacon, with the 406 megahertz beacon. When it's activated and captured uh, by the Galileo satellites and transmitted to the MRCC in four minutes instead of four hours, well, that makes it much more quicker and uh, the chance to find the people um, to survive, let's say, uh, you have a bigger chance to survive. If we just see, if when we see the camera, I'm sure we'll pick it up right now uh, as the boat is uh, sort of stopping alongside the life raft to really see how choppy the sea is, that it is not smooth at all, that it's a very rough day weather-wise with windy and waves. But I can see that Tara is lifted on board the rescue boat Orca. So I just saw her head. I think they got her on board now and leave the life. What happens to the life raft, by the way, after this? 
the live raft will be picked up. And uh, if it's not possible for picking up the live raft, uh, the rubbers will be cut so no other persons or other passing vessels might think there's another person in distress. But normally it will be picked up or towed to the port of Austin. But for sure, we won't leave it at sea. And, and Stefan, because I have to, I just saw how choppy that was when they had uh, to take her out and the, the Orca lifeboat actually sort of, uh, sort of somewhat got very close to the water in this position. Now, when you have the helicopter, which is sort of then hovering around there, how low does it go? It, it descends up to uh, 80 to 100 feet, uh, not lower than that, uh, to avoid too much downwash on the, uh, on the crew and on the ship. So it's, it's uh, pretty high, in fact, uh, to limit the uh, effect of downwash on the, on the victims. And first, you have to have a diver, I believe, and a medic to go down, and they have to actually hit the boat and not the waves next to it. In function of uh, what we receive from, of information from the MRCC, if somebody is injured or not injured, we will drop the diver or the diver with uh, the rescue man. So uh, the medic, the nurse, but in that case, I think we only will uh, drop the, the diver to pick up uh, the, the victim. Yeah. And uh, you just, because uh, I can see, I can hear this helicopter, you just make sure that uh, when the real helicopter, the Cayman, is, is, is arriving, you will let me know. Um, when we're talking about the crews going out there, I mean, this is a, this is a calling. You don't just turn into uh, a, a, a rescue crew member, be it uh, for helicopters or in, uh, in your rescue center. Uh, you're not doing that for pay. I mean, what sort of people decide to do the kind of job that you're doing? Well, we need uh, some uh, motivated people that, uh, that like to take some risks, of course, uh, that like to go to fly over water, because most of the missions that we do are over, over water. Uh, it's also uh, a training that takes at uh, approximately three years before they are uh, accurate with, uh, to fly this helicopter and to perform the mission. And uh, they, are, they have also to be uh, standby 24-7 uh, the whole year through. So it's, uh, it's a job that uh, needs some uh, sacrifices and some, uh, some uh, personal motivation to, to do it. And it is World Maritime Day today, I was told. Uh, and the motto this year is to empower women uh, in, in maritime uh, professions, maritime circumstances. Uh, why is that important? Well, it's good. All jobs are open for women and for men. Uh, so it's important to attract women uh, for a life at sea so they can join and do the same profession as a man at sea. <laughs> How many women work with you? I, I think you, you told me you were the first woman in charge of an MRCC in Belgium. So how many more are there now? Uh, well, for the moment, we are working with three women. I have two operators, well-motivated operators working at the MRCC. I'm in charge uh, of the MRCC since 10 years. But my first pro uh, profession was being a sailor for the merchant shipping. And of course, uh, on this very important day also we have uh, with with tara our also female uh, volunteer would you be doing that i, I could do it i could do it also but uh, we have also females uh, in our crews uh, we have uh, 10 pilots uh, capable to do search and rescue operations and out of this 10 we have one uh, female that is doing uh, as well as the as the boys so what is happening now with orca orca is uh, waiting for the helicopter to arrive. And in the meantime, they try and make the person they rescued feel good. Is there any more communication going on? Yes, there's continuously going uh, com communication because on the shore side where you have the MRCC, where you have the subcenter of Coxid, people want to gather as much as possible information because other partners have to be informed as well, like hospitals, ambulances. So uh, sharing of information is very important. What happens now on board of the Orca, they will do uh, the first examination of the victim. They will pass through all this information to the necessary services. If uh, additional assistance is required, then they will ask it as well. And further instructions will be passed uh, by the MRCC to the helicopter and to the Orca, let's say for taking the, um, the life raft on tow. Uh, they will ask if there's any spill, if there are any other persons who are injured, uh, what happened exactly with this lady, was she on board of a vessel? All this information has to be gathered to make sure that your story is complete. And how 
especially now also from, from the helicopter uh, rescue side, how has uh, Ga Galileo satellites and, and their search and rescue uh, service, how has this changed, if at all, your work? It will make uh, the part of the search in the search and rescue operation, the part of the search, uh, more accurate. Uh, in the former times, we had to concentrate on a corner of uh, 10 kilometers on 10 kilometers. Now, with uh, that Galileo system, it will be reduced to a corner of uh, two on two kilometers. So it will easier the, the, the search zone and the search time. And so you can go over more quickly to the, to the rescue operation, where we reduce the time that the people is uh, into the water. So, whatever money a, a program like the Galileo satellite uh, service costs, it's worth it from your point of view? From our side of view, it's uh, for sure worth. Uh, the less time we lose, uh, the better position we have, the more percentage of a survival time. It's always welcome for everybody, for every seaman. <laughs> All right, then let's just keep an eye out on the rescue boat and uh, have our eyes peeled to find out where the helicopter is. How far is Coxseed from here? Coxseed is uh, 30 kilometers from here, so flying time approximately five minutes. But uh, we need the time that the, the crew uh, fits uh, itself, that uh, jump to the, into the helicopter, start up. It takes 20 minutes, so uh, as from we received the scramble from the MRCC, uh, 24, 25 minutes later, we should be on scene. Okay, so we should see it fairly soon. Then let's let's watch a little bit, and uh, you keep watching from with Orca. us. Can you read me over? Diver for Orca over. Yes, question, sir. Can you go to the life raft, recuperate the uh, PLP uh, thing, and shut it down, please? Triton 62, Triton 62, Belgian Coast Guard, come in. Okay, Diver, you have understood my question and you will recuperate the PLB and shut it down. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you very much, sir. Austin Coast Guard, this is Orca, over. Orca, Austin Coast Guard. Yes, I followed uh, the conversation. Thank you very much, sir. Triton 62, Triton 62, Virgin Coast Guard, come in. Triton 62, Triton 62, Belgian Coast Guard, come in. <coughs> Triton 62, Triton 62, Belgian Coast Guard, come in. Yes, stand back. We have been Triton 6-2. Triton 6-2, the Belgian Coast Guard. Yes, uh, we have uh, 
the situation, an activation of a uh, personal location beacon, and we've just recovered the female person. The uh, person was in the water. Do you have something to copy? Yes, I'm ready to copy uh, the coordinates. Triton 62, uh, this is the Belgian Coast Guard. The victim has been recovered by SAR vessel Romeo 6 Orca in the following present position 500 degrees, 15 decimal 23 north, 002 degrees, 5 power decimal 31 east. Over. So, Mr. C from uh, the Triton 62, female person. Um, evacuated by the Romeo 6 Orca. Can you repeat the last of course? Triton 6 to I re repeat the long lap position. 5 1 degrees, 1 5 decimal 2 3 north, 0 0 2 degrees, 5 power decimal 3 1 east. Over. Okay, position is north 5 1 1 5 decimal 2 3, east 0 0 2 5 4 decimal 3 1, estimating in uh, two minutes. Okay, copy it. Uh, 6 2 additional information. This is a female person. Uh, additionally, she had some hypothermia, but now we are aware of the fact that she has some burning wounds in the face and the arms. So, a medical evacuation is requested. Over. That's a good copy. So, female person with hypothermia and also some burn wounds, and a medical evacuation is required. Right on 6 2. 6 2, and the information on the scene we have a southwesterly wind. Four seven three zero nine. Okay, knot, and we two, have two, just been informed that the helicopter, the NH ninety, the Cayman helicopter, is here. We can actually, if you can see it, it's approaching now from uh, Coxie the uh, air base, about uh, twenty three kilometers, you said, or thirty kilometers south of Ostende. So here it comes. Now I've been told that this is going to be very noisy. So just to jog our memory again, so it comes in here. And it's going to do what? Uh, no, it will, uh, as, as seen the target, will uh, circle around the target to see where they can uh, take the best position for the pickup of the victim. Then position itself, uh, preferably into the wind to gain some lift, and then proceed with uh, the winching operation to pick up the victim on the boat. I just see also see that there are various other vessels out at sea right now that have nothing to do with our uh, live demonstrations. These are just ordinary vessels. How do you deal with them? You have to somehow communicate with them as well when something like this goes on, right? Yes, we are doing. We are broadcasting a safety message. Uh, we are informing the vessels in the vicinity they have to stay away from the Orca because we will do a winching operation. If it was necessary to have extra uh, vessels to give assistance, we might have called them to give extra assistance, but it's not necessary now. The only thing we are doing now is giving, passing them information. They have to keep clear from the Orca to do the winching operation in a good order. So it's not like on a motorway when there is a, an accident, they're not all stopping to watch. They're, this is a very sort of very straightforward uh, procedure that all the vessels, the small and the big ones, I mean, this is also a ferry connection, they all adhere to that. Well, if they heard uh, an emergency call on the Channel 16, most of the vessels, they will call the MRCC as well and ask him then if they have to provide assistance, that might happen as well. If they don't ask it, no problem, but we inform all the vessels in the vicinity to keep clear of the position where the situation is going on. All right, and Isabel, my, my little voice in my ear, said something about that the uh, ah here we are exactly that it's approaching now in order to get the winching up ready so to to basically winch Tara up but for that the diver on the helicopter first has to go down and uh, there we again can see that uh, depending on the weather conditions I mean it is windy today but you probably have to perform this sometimes in even worse conditions uh, can, can the weather conditions actually stop such a rescue operation? Well, rescue operations are supposed to take place in all possible kind of weather. So uh, we take some, some risks, but uh, we are supposed to intervene in also in the worst uh, weather conditions as possible. And we train therefore each day. Uh, like today we train also, it's a business as usual for us, 
each day we, we do the same exercise uh, to winch up uh, uh, somebody uh, out of a vessel. So how do you coordinate the helicopter up here and Orca down there? They have to sort of somehow be coordinated that the diver who goes down actually hits the boat and, uh, as I said, not misses it. How does that work? In fact, uh, there is a contact between the boat and the helicopter for the position and to ask the, the boat to take a certain direction so that the helicopter can perform the winching into the wind. Uh, and then one, once we, have above, we are above the position to, uh, to start the winch uh, exercise, well, at that time uh, the, the cabin operator, the flight engineer on board, uh, is taking care of uh, the drop of the, 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 the diver onto the boat. And at that time, uh, there is no contact anymore between the, the, the ship and the helicopter. But it's the, the, the flight engineer that is taking the, the controls of this uh, winch operation to drop the, uh, the diver on the boat. Because right now, for me as a sort of uh, an amateur watching this, it looks like the boat is uh, trying to get away from the helicopter. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, for the exercise here, there are some uh, uh, requests from the helicopter, uh, because in the helicopter we have also some uh, camera uh, TV team uh, requesting, I, I think, some uh, different positions to, for the pictures, but not for, it's not in that way that we work uh, normally. Okay, so that dance, that dance that we're seeing there between the helicopter and, and uh, the rescue boat Orca, uh, it, it doesn't have to be that way. This is, this is a little bit of show right now. Okay, this is a little bit of show. But of course we want to see something as we're out here. Uh, and actually it's, it's getting slightly more choppy here, uh, even on board the Sirius. And when I see out there, uh, I'm sure that Tara will be looking forward uh, to being winched up on uh, the helicopter, inside the helicopter and then uh, flown back. But the helicopter is certainly coming lower now. So I just look forward to the moment when the diver goes out and hangs in the air and yeah. searches the boat. I, I think we are still busy, I think, with some camera shoots and uh, yeah. some special effects, special effects, but not for, with real winching operation. Because for the winching operation, he has to, go, to be above the, the boat, of course, yeah. and not on, on, on the side. But I also imagined that a helicopter like this, sort of hovering around, would create much more uh, disturbance in the sea. But right now, it sort of looks as, yeah. as if it can, uh, well, it has very little influence on it. Yeah. We, we don't see it from here, but if you, are, if you were under, the, under the, 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 the helicopter, you should feel effect, the, the effect of the rotor, uh, of the downwash of the rotor. And then we have a very brave man there, presumably a man, could also be a woman, I don't know, can't see that from here. Uh, but that's the diver going down there. Yeah, we have uh, a team of eight divers uh, also uh, taking care of the 24-7 uh, standby. Uh, all males, we don't have any female uh, diver up to now, but it can come. We have also eight uh, nurses, and one of them is also a female, but most of the, the crew are, are men on board of the helicopter. Now we see that the uh, diver will try to jump on the, uh, on the boat uh, to, uh, to land and to pick up the, the victim that is now waiting for, uh, for rescue. But the winching up will be easier than the diver going down trying to get the boat? Yes, no, the, uh, the, the operator of the winch has now to, to take care to, to put the diver on the right place on this small ship. Uh, but once we, the, the, the diver is on the ship, it will be an easy operation to pick him up and to bring him into the helicopter. It's more easy to winch down than to reach up. Uh, more easy to, to reach up than to reach down. Were you ever tempted to do something like that? No, I'm happy with my job ashore in the MRCC. <laughs> Better, better being in control and, and passing on what needs to be done. Yeah, that uh, would suit me better as well than watching what I see. It's an operation that we do approximately uh, for real than uh, 80 times a year. 80 times? 80 times. We have eight, 80, approximately uh, 80 scrambles a year. And we, uh, we save approximately 40 to 50 lives, lives a year. And uh, is, it, uh, is there sort of a specific part here uh, in the channel? where it happens the most? Is there somewhere where you say, or is it completely arbitrary? No, it, it can happen everywhere. Uh, we have to pick up people who are falling overboard uh, from merchant shippings, from sailing vessels, uh, from fishing vessels, but we can have people being sick uh, who, needs, uh, who require a medical evacuation, as well from merchant vessels, uh, pleasure crafts, and it can happen everywhere in the area of responsibility. But they don't have the 
406 megahertz cost per sunset beacon just yet, or do they? Well, uh, the merchant vessels, as from a certain uh, gross tonnage, uh, they, they must have this beacon, this EPIRB. Uh, for the pleasure craft, the people, they have to wear a jacket, and on top of the jacket, we all advise them to have an, uh, an emergency beacon. In case of emergency, they can activate and broadcast uh, a safety message or a pan pan or a mayday message. They are in danger. Because, uh, I mean, we're fairly close and we can see a lot, but I cannot see the details of what the, uh, the diver is uh, going to do with Tara now. She's already wearing a wetsuit. Uh, will she get an extra harness in order to be winched up? She, she will be uh, taken in charge by the diver, so we'll, she will hang at, uh, at the diver, and together they will be winched up into the helicopter safely. So she will, she will not be uh, winched alone. But the diver will uh, take care of her and take her with him. Into the but, but it's not going to be a, a vertical lift uh, because we see that the boat and the helicopter, uh, they're, they're not sort of in the same line. So there'll be a bit of sort of flying. Yeah, uh, normally they are above because from here, from the, this perspective, you can see, but they are line in fact. But we have a, a kind of parallax and we have the impression that they are not following the same line, but they do. And especially when they are uh, performing the winching. They have to be above the, sh the ship, of course. Now, Tara is a volunteer, so she will play ball with whatever happens. Has it already happened that you're trying to rescue somebody and that person says, I'm not going up on that helicopter? I mean, what do you do in such a situation? I don't remember that we have met such a kind of situation because I think that all people that need to be rescued will be happy to see the helicopter and to, be the di to see the diver because they, they will be caught wet so they, they want to, to be picked up as soon as possible for to some to have some uh, uh, medical uh, service uh, the that you see is uh, the nh90 is a, a new helicopter that we have in service since 2014 uh, we have uh, four of them and we do uh, especially search and rescue operations but we do also uh, operation shipborne operations for the marine for the uh, the belgian marine so it's a helicopter that, is, uh, that has a lot of possibilities, not only for search and rescue, but also for marine operations. And the helicopter seems to be shoot, shooting off. Then we, I didn't see the, the wind shop. Could you see it? Could you see her being pulled up there? I didn't see it, uh, but I think that there are some uh, taking some shoots and <laughs> to perform uh, again a landing on the ship uh, because I didn't see yet uh, the, the winching of no. Still on board, <laughs> maybe if she likes it on there, maybe she doesn't want to maybe get off there. How many of these helicopters do you have? Because, I mean, this one right now is used for a live demonstration, uh, but a real emergency could happen at the same time. How many uh, are, do you have at your disposal? Yeah, we have uh, in total four helicopters, uh, NH-90, and today we have two helicopters serviceable. Uh, one of them is now performing exercise uh, for Galileo, and the other one is in standby at Coxhead for a real uh, emergency. And your crew at the MRCC, are they going to follow this now, or are they also busy following right now real emergencies? I hope there is none, but just in case there was. They are doing both. Uh, they are following this situation because they still have to do some coordination, even if it's an exercise. If we have another incident at the same time, at the MRCC, they will split up and one will occupy himself with uh, this situation and the other person will occupy him with the real uh, incident. But apart from that, um, we have the flying assets, we have the surface assets, we have more uh, surface assets in the port of Blankenberg, we can use in the port of Newport and even in the port of Ostend. So in case we have to scale up, we can call other uh, surface assets as well. You're well equipped. I'm just trying to look through that window screen to see if, if I can see our, our volunteer victim somewhere hiding in there. Maybe already enjoying a cup of coffee or something while we're still waiting to, for her to be winched up. Okay, so the helicopter is coming back. Diver, uh, Zodiac from uh, Triton. Yeah. 
just through Porca. Can you hear me? Porca, this is the side of the door. Divers in Zodiac from Orca, if you can hear me, the personal locator beacon is still transmitting. Please shut it down. Shut it down. Driver, this is uh, Driver 62. Driver 62, this is Driver, we are waiting for the winching. First of all, the winching is over. And the second winching is over. That's a good copy. A bad solo and then the Driver with Oscar. Uh, driver 62. Now looking like the real thing, the helicopter is certainly closing in, and there, there, she's been pulled up. She is pulled up, so she will be safe in a few moments on board of the helicopter. This time she is uh, reached up alone, as I see, but uh, because the situation is not so dangerous, but in, in general, they are reached up with uh, the help of the diver. But in that case, I impression it would be alone, or it was the nurse that has reached, this reached up now. And we will still see a second reach up, but we have to confirm that uh, once we see the the movement of the helicopter. So what, how, how would the movement, uh, if, if, it, if it leaves, then it would be a confirmation, what, what sign? If it leaves now, it means that uh, everybody is now winched up and on board and ready to go to the next station, but uh, I cannot confirm that from here. I don't see it uh, too much. So we're basically now waiting to be absolutely certain that it was Tara being winched up and that Tara is in the helicopter, inside the helicopter, safe and sound. Oh, so the medic. I just get confirmation it was the medic. Okay, and Tara will be next. And maybe she will not be on her own then. We'll see. That That is something... I hope she will be, uh, voila, she's together with uh, the diver. That's normal procedures to be picked up with, uh, by the diver, yeah. And now they will be safely into the helicopter and go to the, uh, back to the home base. Okay, so I think we can be sure that we've just seen Tara there with the diver being winched up and pulled inside the helicopter. The helicopter now leaving the scene. Rescue boat Orca also done its job. That means from that point of view, from the rescue point of view, we can say mission accomplished. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And of course, a big thank you to the entire rescue crew. This was a live demonstration, but nevertheless, the circumstances and all the procedures were real and they just saved our volunteer, Tara Foster. They took her off the life raft onto the rescue boat Orca R6 and from there winched her up into the helicopter, the NH-90. And what is the takeaway? From the moment she activated the 406 megahertz Cospa Sarsad beacon, until the moment the rescue operation was launched, it took a mere three and a half minutes. Without the Galileo satellite service, it can take up to four hours. And given the roughness of the sea, I would say that Tara and all the victims who happen to be in this situation will appreciate the Galileo satellite service making things shorter. I certainly appreciate it. Thank you very much for following our live broadcast of Operation Shark Bait. Haven't seen any sharks, but we got the bait. Bye-bye.